gives from you So I honor your blessing by blessing the way you do So grab your seats. If you have a Bible, want to open up to Matthew 25. That's where we'll be tonight, uh, Matthew chapter 25. If you don't have a Bible, uh, feel free to pull that up on your phone. If you straight up don't own a Bible, we say this uh, from time to time here, but we have a shelf full of Bibles in the back. We would love for that to be our no strings attached gift to you so that you can have a copy of the Bible. Uh, as you grab your Bibles or pull those open, uh, I want to make you aware um, one more time about these. Uh, these are, if you don't know, we've been in the midst of a teaching series where we spent six weeks looking at a particular topic in the Bible. Uh, and as we look at this teaching series, we have created an aid for that series, and that is this booklet uh, that I'm holding in my hand. It has devotionals, places to take notes. Uh, it has uh, just quotes and interesting ideas that may help you uh, kind of learn and grow throughout this series. So you'll see a number of people that have them throughout the room. If you don't own one, or you lost yours, or you would just like a copy of this, if this would help, uh, we would love to give you a thousands of copies. Uh, just slip your hand up right now where you're at, and we will make sure those get distributed. Uh, I see some down here. As always, we'll say this. We'll, uh, raise your hand. Just keep it up. We're going to distribute those books, get those out to you. If you don't have a pen, uh, just go ahead and slip your book up into the air, and there's a group running through with pens, too. So hand in the air for a book, book in the air for a pen. All right, I see some people down here who need books, people who need pens. Love it, guys. Just keep your hand up or your book up. We're going to get to you. We want to make sure you have that as we dive into tonight's teaching. Hey, as we do, I'll remind you kind of what we've been doing here as we continue to pass out. And again, you can keep slipping your hand up, your book up if you need um, some resources. I'll remind me what, we, what we've been up to for the last five weeks. It's been very simple. Uh, the statement we've tried to make is that God blesses his people with all kinds of things, these good gifts that God gives to each of us that are his children. God blesses us and that there is a right way of handling those blessings, but then there is also a wrong way of handling those blessings. And so if you've been here over the weeks, what we've done each week is we've kind of taken a different blessing and said, what is this blessing that God gives me? And then how am I supposed to use this in the world? And what could go wrong if I use this in the wrong way? And so we've looked at things like God blesses us with salvation. What do we do with that salvation? How do we pass that along to others? We talked about God blesses us with money, like cash, and how are we supposed to use that to bless the world? And we talked about how last week God blesses us um, with opportunities, with friendships, with like places we can invite people into, and how can we use that to be a blessing to the world? And so in that same vein tonight, uh, in our fifth of six weeks in the series, I, I just want to bring up um, just another really special, important area that God blesses his children. Uh, and here's how we'll put it. God blesses his children with the capacity to bless the world. I'll just start really simply. God blesses his children with the capacity to bless the world. In other words, God blesses you with all kinds of material things, but there's an immaterial blessing that God gives to each of his children, and that is the capacity he has given you to do something that would bless the world. This comes down to our skills and our abilities, our talents, our spiritual gifts, the things we have inside of us that give us the capacity to do something good in this world. It, you'll see I listed a bunch of the things up here, and the point isn't that you would write down this list or know everything on this list. The point is that these are some examples of some of the ways that God blesses his children with the intention that you would take that blessing and turn around and bless the world. In fact, we really can't get going on the parable Jesus tells and the warning he gives tonight. We really can't talk about that at all until you start to be very, very clear on how God has actually blessed you. In fact, I'm convinced that you won't be able to use God's blessing in your life to bless the world until you are crystal clear on how God's blessed you in the first place. And so what I want to talk about tonight, before we even jump into the parable, is the fact that everyone in this room has been wired and designed by God in a specific way. And the way I want to teach that tonight uh, is borrowing from uh, a guy named Pastor Rick Warren, who, who, who gave this analogy, this image, that every one of us has been created uh, by God in a certain shape. And so I want to put this word shape up here uh, and give you sort of what this means in five different parts. Um, God has created each of you in a certain shape, um, and, and here's how it'll start. The S here is going to stand for something. It stands for spiritual gifts. I believe every single Christian who has been born again by the Spirit of God has been gifted with at least one spiritual gift, 
A spiritual gift isn't any talent or ability you have. A spiritual gift isn't anything you do well. There are specific spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible. We've done sermons on spiritual gifts here, but if you want to go to the best place in the Bible to look at this, if you want to look at it at a later time, 1 Corinthians 12 is your place to go. You can look and see what the spiritual gifts are. There's other places, Romans 13, you can look at as well. But God gifts his people with the capacity and the ability to build up the body of Christ with specific spiritual gifts that he gives to us. And here's my contention before I even go on to the next one. My contention is that if you're in this room and you're a Christian and you don't know what your spiritual gift is, you need to find out in a hurry. Or you will end up wasting your life not knowing what God has actually put you on this earth to do. I believe every Christian should know their spiritual gift. If you don't know your spiritual gifts, you won't know how you're supposed to use them for God's glory. You should know your spiritual gifts. The H here is going to stand for heart. Like your heart is your passions. I believe God has wired each of us with different passions, different things that get us excited, different things that get us frustrated and angry, different things that fire us up in the world. Like I know some Christians who are passionate about poverty and homelessness and hungry people. And so they spend their entire lives serving people who don't have physical resources. And then I know other Christians who are passionate about little kids, passionate that young children would know they have value and worth and dignity in the world, and so they serve those kids. I know other Christians who their entire life has been built around serving people who have disabilities, kids with special needs, adults with special needs. I know other people who are passionate about worship. I know other people who are passionate about teaching. Every different person has a different passion. And the point isn't that you're supposed to have the same passion as the person sitting next to you. The point is that you're supposed to identify, how has God made me passionate? And maybe I'm passionate about something else than my friend is, or my brother is, or my uncle is, or even you're passionate about something that HSM isn't even a part of. That's not a bad thing. You should be passionate about those things. And so part of figuring out your shape is figuring out what you're passionate about. Your spiritual gifts, your heart, A is abilities. It's the abilities you have. Some of you have the ability to sing. Like, truly sing. Like, we all are like, yeah, I can sing, but, like, you can sing, all right? No one's horrified when you're singing, all right? Some of you have that ability. Some of you have the ability to do math well. And I don't understand you. I don't get you. Some of you are pointing at someone in the room. You're like, that girl can do math, and I cannot. Hey, listen, some of you, some of you are incredibly gifted um, in some area of art, Like, we all take pictures with our phone, but when you take a picture, people are like, oh, yeah. Like, you see that. Or, or, or like, you can draw well, or you can shoot video or edit video well. Like, you have the ability to do art well. Maybe you you, you paint or you do something that's actually spectacular that most of us couldn't do. Some of you are athletically gifted. Like, Like, you're actually just good at things, and you're not even sure why. You're just good at doing certain things. And maybe it's not every sport, but you can shoot a basketball, or you can hit a softball, or you can play football. It's just You're just so good at it. Listen, I want you to know that that ability, you may have cultivated that, but the fact that you have the ability uh, to even do that thing is not something you generated. It's a gift God gave you. And part of being a a Christian who knows what God has put you on this earth to do and then going out and doing it is knowing what your abilities are. God hasn't gifted you at everything. He's gifted you at some things. So you know your spiritual gifts. You know your heart. You know your abilities. P is you know your personality. What kind of person are you? Some of you are extroverted. Meaning you walk into a big room of new people and you're meeting people and it energizes you and you're excited and it's the best thing ever and let's go to that party and meet all these new people. And some of you hear that and you're like, I am so stressed out. You're like, I just want to be with my three best friends and we can just watch reruns of Friends all night, all day, every time. That's all we do. We just sit there and watch reruns and never speak to anyone other than each other. And you draw energy from being either alone or just with your closest friends. Here, listen to me. It's just about knowing. There's no good or bad here. Some of you are more like dynamic and aggressive in your personality. You walk in the room, you're like, hi, I'm here. And others of you are like, we'll just kind of quietly be here. You know, like some of you are loud, some of you are quiet, some of you um, have a lot of confidence, some of you are more shy. There's a lot of different ways that's going to play out. Um, but listen, part of knowing how God's wired you is recognizing that, that this is who you are. Um, for some reason, there's a myth sometimes in Christian circles, and I think it's for the fact that, you know, like, Leaders tend to stand up on stages and be in front of crowds, but there's a myth that like, you have to be super outgoing and extroverted in order to make a difference for God's kingdom, and I've just never found that to be true. In fact, some of the most powerful Christians I've ever met are introverted, quiet, people who serve, people who don't need a lot of attention, people you'll never see on this stage, but God uses them to great effect. 
It's knowing your personality and being okay with your personality rather than trying to be like someone else. It's your spiritual gifts. It's your heart. It's your ability. It's your personality. And the final one is your experience. The experiences you walk through are something God uses to shape you, and it's something that he ultimately uses to bless the world. Even hard experiences. Like I know there's lots of you in this room who have walked through just devastating things in your childhood. Like I know a lot of you in this room walked through the divorce of your parents. I know some of you walked through illness. Some of you in the last year have walked through someone stabbing you in the back and betraying you. You've walked through heartache. You've walked through disappointment. You've walked through that. You've experienced that. And as much as those things are hard to walk through, those experiences shape you into the rest of your life. They give you more compassion for people. They make you uh, more soft toward people who are hurting. You understand them in a different way. God can use even disappointing experiences for his good and for his glory. And then on the other side, even the good stuff. Like God uses those experiences. If you're successful in something, if you've done something well, if you had a great experience, a great relationship, a great trip, a great thing you did in your life, God's going to use the good, the bad, and everything in between to shape you. And here's why this matters so much. We talk about spiritual gifts, heart, ability, and we talk about personality and experience. I believe that as a Christian, if you can't identify all of these things in your life, you're never going to be, live, be able to live into what God has for you. Like, don't miss that. If you spend the rest of your life never figuring out what all of these things are for you, never knowing, what, what am I passionate about? How's God give to me? What's my spiritual gift? If you don't know these things, you are never, ever, ever going to live the life God gave to you because you won't know what he's equipped you to do it with. I think this week some of you need to spend time journaling about this, thinking about this. Maybe in your small group this week, you just start to kind of peel these open and discuss it. Maybe you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, but if you mention to a friend, I don't even know what that is, they'd probably answer quicker than you can. It's important that you know, but then here's step two, and this is important. It's important that you know. It's also important that you don't apologize for the way God's gifted you. I think there are a lot of Christians who apologize for the way God's gifted them have to apologize for the fact that God's gifted them to do something. And so maybe you have a spiritual gift and ability. Maybe your personality and your experience lends you to actually want to lead in a ministry or be up here singing on stage or, or actually have an ability that's actually beautiful and impressive to the world and God can use for amazing things for his glory and your good. But you're so apologetic about it. And I think some of you think that's humility, but that's not humility. You pretending God hasn't gifted you, you downplaying the gifts God gave to you, isn't humility, it's insulting to God. It's insulting to him. Like, I want you to think about this. I've used this before, but I've talked about um, the fact that when I proposed to Danny, I gave her a ring and put that ring on her finger, and this was my gift to her. It was like what I gave her. And I want you to imagine two days after I proposed, and she has this brand new diamond ring on her finger that someone says, I want to see your ring, and she goes, no, it's not that great. Like, I want you to imagine someone says to her, I want to see your ring. And she goes, it's not that great. They say, no, 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 I want to see it. She puts her hands in her pocket and says, no, it's not even like, I, I, it's not even like a real thing. I don't even care. In that moment, it might sound like she's being humble. What she's actually doing is insulting the person who got her the ring, saying it's not enough. It's not good enough. I don't like it. I'm not proud of it. Let me tell you something. There is no humility in you pretending God didn't gift you. There's no humility in you pretending that your gift isn't something God wants to use to the fullest extent for the world. I think some of you shy away from the idea that you have gifts because you're so afraid of sounding proud, you're so afraid of sounding unhumble that you actually insult God by pretending he didn't gift you the exact way he did. See, step one is understanding what your shape is, how God has actually gifted you, but step two is you saying, I will not apologize for this gift. I am going to use it for God's glory. I'm going to use it in every way possible, and I'm not going to shrink back because others are jealous. I'm not going to shrink back because others um, are intimidated or, or they're afraid or they misunderstand me or they don't like me or they criticize me. I think so much of your life will, will be shaped by you understanding who you are and how God has called you to live in this world. I want you to keep this in mind as we hear this parable this evening. We'll start in verse 14 of Matthew 25. Jesus gives a story where he's going to talk about this very thing and how we put this into action. He says in verse 14, he says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. So this is a parable uh, about two kind of groups of people. One individual, a man, who goes on a journey. This man is meant to represent God. Then it says he calls his servants and he brings his servants in and he gives them his property. So the servants are meant to represent you and me. This is a story about how God goes away and leaves us with his property. 
And I think the important thing to see here is that it's God's property, not ours. It's the man's property, not the servant's. Like God, he has given a gift to us, that shape we just talked about. This is a parable about how human beings handle the gifts that God has given them. It goes on in verse 15. It says, to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. I'll point out what might be going on in your translation to the Bible versus what's on screen. It says talent here, and in your translation, if you're reading like the NIV, it might say bags of gold. And the reason it, it, there's a discrepancy there is because the word talent in the Greek language that the Bible's written in isn't about an ability or a skill or a passion. It's about an amount of money. So if I said, here's a talent, what I would be saying to you is, here is an amount of gold. And that is an amount of gold that is equal to, get this, 20 years worth of labor, like 20 years worth of work. And so the guy who gets five talents gets 100 years worth of money. And the person who gets two talents gets 40 years worth of money. And the person who gets one talent gets 20 years worth of money. The man gifts each of them an amount of gold. But, but then here's the thing I, I just want to make sure you see here. God doesn't gift each of them an equal amount of gold. He doesn't. This is a story about God gifting different people in different ways. And we're not ultimately told everything about why. It says according to their ability. But I want you to write this down, that God does not gift each of us equally. He doesn't. This is the story about God not gifting everyone the same and saying, go do something with it. It's about God gifting people unequally. And this throws Christians off sometimes because we believe God loves us equally, and he does. Because we believe that God saved us equally, and he does. But when it comes to gifting, when it comes to how God has gifted you to make a difference in this world, the stark reality is that God has not gifted me and you the same way. He hasn't. He's gifted us differently. Some people are gifted more than you. Some people just have more gifting than you in a particular area. Maybe in a particular area they have more gifting, in a particular area they have less, but maybe they have less gifting than you. Maybe you're more gifted than some other people. I think one of the most peaceful things you can start to believe in your life is this statement, that you would just get to a place where you go, you know what? God hasn't gifted me as equal as everyone else. Like when you can just get to a place where you're not feeling the need to be as gifted as everyone else in the world, it actually brings you an amazing amount of peace. And if you refuse to believe this statement, you will live the rest of your life anxious and overwhelmed. You will. I want you to imagine if I decided today um, that I would like to be a professional basketball player, okay? So don't, don't laugh. If there was a laugh, I'm mad at you. But, but let's say I decided I'm going to do this, right? Let's say I decided I'm going to train every day. I'm going to quit my job as a pastor. I'm just going to work out and train and play basketball every day. I bet you over the next couple of years, I could become pretty good at basketball, like pretty good, but, but I'm never going to be LeBron James, right? I'm just never going to be him. Why? Because whatever you want to say about work ethic, whatever you want to say about anything else, he's been gifted in a certain way that, that I've just not been gifted I think some of you, if you said, okay, I'm going to do everything I can to train up and to sing better. I sing, but I want to sing better. I want to improve my singing. I want to be better at this. I think there's just the reality that we have to embrace, um, that you're probably never going to be as good as whatever that singer is that you put up on a pedestal and decided, that's my singer that I want to be like. I think part of growing up spiritually is recognizing that God has not gifted me the same as everyone else, and I will be at peace when I stop trying to pretend that I am. When I just go, this is how God has gifted me, and it's more than some people, and it's less than other people, but rather than trying to be just as good as everyone else, athletically, artistically, academically, just saying, I am going to do everything I can with what God has given me, rather than trying to be just like everyone else. I think for some of you students right now, like this is just the wrestle of your life right now. You see other people, and they don't even have to try, and they ace the test. They're not even working out that hard, but they're the all-star athlete. They're not even seeming to really put that much effort in, and yet it just works out for them. And I think you have to recognize God's gifted people unequally. We don't get to understand everything about why, but part of being at peace as a Christian is just going, listen, I haven't been gifted like that person, but it means I'm going to use every ounce of what God has given me rather than wishing I was gifted like that other person. You comparing your gifts to other people will make you miserable. You can take that to the bank. You will be absolutely miserable for the rest of your life if you spend your time comparing your gifts to someone else. It continues on this way in verse 15. It says, Then he, and this is the master, went away. 
This is the story ultimately of a man who leaves. It's the story of a man who entrusts his stuff to his people and then he leaves. It's the story uh, of what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to respond when God seems absent. That's what this story is about here. It goes on in verse 16. It said, he would receive the five talents when at once and traded with them. He made five talents more. So also the one who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. So again, this is the story of a man who gives gifts, who gives talents, who gives things to his people. He gives it unequally, but he gives it with the expectation that they're going to go do something, and then he leaves and he goes away. And it says the guy who gets five talents, he goes and invests it. He does something with it. He makes more money than he was given. Same with the guy with two talents. But it says with the guy with one talent, he, he digs a hole in the ground and buries his master's money. He plays it safe. He doesn't do anything with it. And then the rest of the parable we're going to look at today is the master, ultimately Jesus' reaction to what we do, to what happens here. Jesus' reaction to the type of people who take the gifts at whatever level they've been given and put them into action versus Jesus' reaction to the individual who has a gift that he's been given, that she's been given, and does nothing with it. I want you to see how it continues in verse 19. It says, now after a long time, the master of those servants came home and settled accounts with them. I want you to see this because this is an important part of the story. There comes a time where the master comes home. There comes a time where the master comes back to settle accounts. And that phrase, he comes back to settle accounts, is a really haunting phrase to me. It's one that really like captures my heart. And if you stop to think about it, actually should capture yours too. Because again, this is referring not just to some random story Jesus is telling. What he's trying to do here is he's trying to refer to the time where Jesus will return to settle accounts with you. What we believe as Christians, there is coming a day where Jesus Christ will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. In other words, there's going to come a day where Jesus returns to this earth. And every Christian, whether they're alive at the time or they're raised to life at the time, will stand judgment before God. And the Bible says we're going to give an account. Like he's going to settle accounts with us. He's going to look into our lives and see what we've done with our lives I was thinking about this the other day. Um, it's interesting being a dad and, and having the baby girl around. Um, it's, it's interesting. Days off have become like a different type of story, right? Like you're never really off with a baby because babies are just constantly trying to like get into things that will end them. Like that's what children do. She's like, here's the sink. Oh, here's like soap. I'll drink it. And you're like, no, like that's being a dad. And so you're never really off. But then there came this weird day for me uh, where I hadn't really been off in a while. And uh, Danny and Grace went to go see Danny. Danny's grandmother, I couldn't make it on the trip, so somehow I ended up with like a day where I had nothing to do. I didn't have to be here at the church, I, I, I wasn't with my family, and so I was just like here alone, and then I thought to myself, maybe you've had this thought on days like this, I am going to get so much done today. Ah, uh -huh, yeah, 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 you know where this is going. I was like, I have a list, I'm going to go down the list, I'm going to start at the top, I'm going to make little check boxes, so I feel so good checking off the list, uh, and, and, and I think everyone in this room knows where this goes. Like, I had this idea of all these things I was going to do, and then I got to the end of the day, and it was like half an item checked off, but it wasn't really finished, and what did I end up doing that day? I ended up just kind of sitting in bed, watching TV, um, I was drinking, you know, drinking soda, why eat Cheez-Its all over me, like, just kind of, like, gross. I was flipping through my phone, kind of like wasting my day. And I was thinking about that. Um, and, and here's what I want to say. Um, there's probably nothing wrong with you having days where you just relax and don't do anything. Like, I want you to know that I think some of you actually probably need to take more of those days in your life. And there's nothing wrong with me watching TV and nothing wrong with me being on my phone. It's not that I was filled with like terrible, horrible activities that day as much as I look back on that day and I go, man, I, I wasted it. Like I wasted a perfectly good day like kind of trying to work and kind of trying to rest. So I wasn't rested at the end of the day because I was trying to work and I didn't really get anything done because I was trying to rest and I just wasted a day. And, and here's the truth. I hate that I wasted a day, but here's my, my greater fear for my life. Um, my greater fear for my life and yours is that we would waste not a day, but our entire life. Like that's my fear for some of you. My fear for some of you is that you're going through high school and you're just kind of doing things because that's what everyone else does. And you're just doing school and you're going to go to college and you hang out on the weekends with your friends and you're never really thinking about how has God wired me and how can I use that gift to bless the world. You're just kind of moving along, not really thinking about it. And so it's not even that you're doing wicked things. Like, believe me, if you're doing wicked, awful, destructive things, I want you to stop. 
But I actually think there's an equal danger in you living the kind of life where you're not doing anything that wicked or destructive. You're just kind of bouncing along, wasting your life rather than actually doing something that matters. And again, I was thinking back to that day and just thinking about how I had the opportunity to be so productive, and yet all I did was just sit around, and and I'll I'll just speak truthfully, most of my day was kind of just on this thing, like just kind of like looking at my phone and being on social media and just kind of having it open and just kind of like flipping through different things and just not like doing nothing. And I was thinking about that in relation to you guys and thinking about the fact that most of you won't waste your life on destructive, horrible, awful, evil things. Like truly, most of you are not going to waste your life on evil things. You will waste your life on things that could be good, but you just instead choose to use them for the most trivial things. In fact, I actually want to talk to you about this for a second. Um, I'm going to ask if you would, and you don't have to if you don't want to, but would everyone just who would in this room just grab your phone right now? Just hold in your hand. Grab your phone. Um, and maybe if you're taking notes in one hand, you can hold your phone, and in the other hand, you can write down this sentence. Um, that I've had to just consider for myself. Um, I must decide whether my phone will be a tool to bless the world or a way to waste my life. I've been thinking about this all week. I've been thinking about the fact that this tool, this thing I'm holding in my hand, is one of the most powerful tools I could possibly use to bless the world. I could encourage people, I could bless people, I could call a friend I haven't talked to in a while, I could text a friend who I know is hurting, I could talk to a family member who I know could just use a conversation and an ear to listen. I could go on social media and encourage people and bless people and post things that are going to help people in their walk with Jesus. I could do all of these things. But I don't know if your life is anything like mine. I don't know. Sometimes that happens. But most of the time, this is just kind of a tool to escape the world. It's a tool to numb the anxiety or the nervousness about the world. It's something I turn to not because I'm using it to be a blessing to the world, but because I'm just kind of bouncing along and just doing what I'm doing and not thinking about the effect this thing has on me. In fact, I was thinking about this so much this week, uh, and someone pointed this out to me. Um, there's this, this feature on um, uh, the iPhone. I'll show it to you. Um, if you swipe uh, to, the, to the right, um, and then you scroll all the way down, if you have the newest stuff, this is on the iPhone. If you have an Android, I don't care. Um, but... Um, but you go down to screen time and you click on this and this is just like heartbreaking if you want to actually, you know, look in the mirror a little bit. Yeah, yeah, the murmur is beginning. Um, and so I pulled this up and so I thought I'd just show you my screen time. This was uh, this past week. Um, here was my screen time. And again, some of you are looking right now. Some of you are too afraid and that's okay too. Um, you can pray about that. But okay, eyes right here, eyes right here. So I pull this up and I notice, okay, I am spending, I am spending three hours and 44 minutes per day on my phone. Now, I took this screenshot while I was preparing this sermon on Thursday. This morning, I got a notification. Sunday morning, I woke up. It said, your screen time has increased 14% this week. I went, no! <laughs> but here's, here, here, here's, here, here's, here's my breakdown. I spent 10 hours and 43 minutes this week on social networking sites. Like, literally over a day's worth of work, I spent on social media. And then entertainment. I guess I was really entertained this week with four hours and 42 minutes. And then here's the biggest lie I tell myself. I don't know if you do the same. I like to tell myself my phone is great for me because I'm really, really productive with it. I'm super productive. Except for the fact that productivity, I have 26 total hours. Only two and a half of those were me being productive. And then you want to know the ultimate pastor shame? Here's my top four. Do you see the Bible app in there? No, you do not. And I defended myself. I'm like, I use the paper one, you know, but it's not even up there. And then you scroll down, next screen. Then you scroll down, and then I see this one. And this is, this is where it really hurt a little bit. Uh, I looked at pickups, 143 per day, uh, which means over the course of a week, I picked up my phone and looked at it 1,000 times. Um, and I was like, wow, 1,000 times I looked at my phone. Um, But then I looked at my notifications and I said, okay, 879 times it buzzed, which actually made me do some depressing math. That means that 126 times I picked up my phone, not because I had a notification, but because I was lonely, because I was overwhelmed, because I was bored, because I had nothing else to do, 126 times. You know what's funny? I was thinking about this this week. Um, 
and prepping this sermon and, and maybe some of you are actually looking at your own stats and, and there's this like weird Christian pride that might be happening if you're lower than where I'm at and like a weird Christian shame that might be happening if you're more than where I'm at. But, but here's my point. I actually want to go back. Can you go back to the hours spent? Here's my point. I told myself um, a couple weeks ago that I was going to call a friend who I haven't talked to since June. I haven't seen him since June. He lives in a different part of the state. It's, he's a buddy of mine from growing up. And I told him that I'd be in touch. And I told myself a couple weeks ago I was going to call him. But you know what I've told myself all week? That I don't have time to call him. That's what I told myself. I don't have time to call him. And everything about this data tells me that I'm lying to myself. That there have been people this week that I could have stopped and prayed for or stopped and actually cared about. There are conversations I was in that I bailed on because I thought I was too busy. And this tells me I'm not even close to that busy. There were times this week where my Bible reading was just kind of pathetic and weak. And I just kind of opened it up and read a verse or two and moved on because I was really busy. And I didn't have time to do that. And I've just found that to be utterly untrue when I look at the data. In fact, can you go back to the screen about pickups? I was thinking about this too. Um, it says here that in a week, and, and again, maybe your data is higher or lower, um, I picked up my phone. I reached for my phone a thousand times. And I was thinking to myself about this. Um, I, I saw a quote. It was really just a couple weeks ago. It's like the Lord's wrestling with me over this. Um, here's what it said. I want to read this to you, this quote um, from a worship leader, Corey Asbury. He said, I want to reach for God the way I reach for my phone. When I'm bored, when I'm uncomfortable, when I need answers or entertainment, when I'm lonely or need someone to talk to. Help me, God. I don't know about you, but I, I just wish in the last week I'd reached for God a thousand times. Like, I don't know what my life would be like. I'm just certain it would be better if I reached for God a thousand times rather than my phone. And, and hear me, I'm not down on phones. I'm not insulting phone use. Like, you're going to use your phones. That's part of life and part of the world. And I really do believe it can be a tool to bless the world and encourage people and make the world a better place. I believe you can use your phones to great effect. But I just want you to be honest about what you're actually doing. I want you to be honest about the data. I want you to look at how much time you're actually spending wasting your life on your phone as opposed to using your phone to be a blessing to this world. See, what Jesus is getting into here is this reality, this fact that we are going to be held accountable for our lives. Like, hear me, you're not going to be held accountable for your adult life. You're going to be held accountable for your life. And that includes now. It includes high school. Jesus isn't going to look at you and be like, ah, you were just a kid. He's going to care about what you did with your life now. The evidence that you are actually walking with Jesus is that you don't just care about your life sometime in the future. You care about your life now because you believe God gave it to you and you owe it all back to him anyway. I want you to see how the parable continues in verse 20. It says, and he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more and said, master, you have delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made you five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I've made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I want you to know that this is a story about how Jesus responds, what the response is to the type of people who manage what God has given them and use that to do good things in this world. Use it to bless the world. Use it to worship God. Use it to bring other people to him. What does God respond with? And I love what this verse responds with. It responds with joy. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into your master's happiness. Come be a part of this joy, this happiness, this delight that I've set up for you. So, so here's what I just want to be really clear about tonight. Um, this is not the type of sermon where I give a whole sermon about how you're supposed to serve and use your gifts. And then at the end of the sermon, we're like, so I need 15 volunteers to set up Friday night lights. And then you feel guilty and you're like, I, I'll do it. You know, like that's not what this is. This isn't like we're desperate for volunteers in middle school ministry and elementary and special needs. And so who wants to be in? And you're all like, we should. Like, that's not what this is about at all. And believe me, if you want to serve in those ministries, I had someone come up after uh, the 11 and say, hey, can I serve in the worship team? Our answer is absolutely. Let's start to have that conversation. Let's dive into that. Let's get after that. So I'm not saying don't serve there. I'm just saying we're not trying to get you to use your gifts and serve for our sake. I'm trying to get you to do it for yours. Because the only path to joy in this world is you using the gifts God has given you and serving. 
It's you taking the life and breath God has put inside you and doing something with it. That's the path to joy. That's the road to your deepest kind of happiness. When you say, God has given me these gifts, these experiences, these passions, these talents, these spiritual gifts, I'm going to use it for his glory. That's the path toward joy. Because hear me, this is not some sort of abstract conversation we're having here. It's not. This is not some kind of abstract, like, yeah, you should think about this. It means you actually go do something with it. Uh, Like, I just think about people in this room who have actually gone and done something with it. I want to point out a few right now. Um, First group I want to point out, there's a number of individuals in this room that are here every single week that most of you probably don't pay a second thought to um, and and that you just need to realize that high school ministry doesn't happen unless you notice them. Uh, Sorry, not unless you notice them, unless they're here. Um, The the, the three people right now sitting in in our tech booth back there, um, their names uh, at the computer is Noel, uh, and then you'll see Paulina, and then you'll see Chris. Yeah. Yeah, those those three. Um, And maybe you think to yourself, yeah, this just magically appears on screen and lights are suddenly on and sound comes out of the speakers. But these people are here early. They're here setting up. They're here using their gifts. Chris is here at usually like 8 o'clock every morning starting to set up and get things ready for our day here in high school ministry. And here's the truth. Chris is using the gift that God has given him to bless the world. God gave him a gift, and he knows his only path toward joy is to put it into use rather than bury it in the ground. The same is true for Paulina. The same is true for Noel. I love thinking about our worship leaders who are up here, and you guys know them, and they're here each week, and I just love seeing how they take their gift and they put it into action. They take their gift and they do something with it. Um, it's really cool this week. We're, we're celebrating. It's, it's just so neat. Uh, we have a brand new worship leader. I don't know uh, if you guys saw her, but uh, Claire is back on the drums. How cool is that? We love you, Claire. Um, and here's, here's, here's what I love. Like, we didn't plan this. This wasn't some strategy, but it's just so cool. Like, this is the week we're talking about. Hey, whatever gift or talent or passion you have, go use it to build up Christ's church. Go use it to bless the world. Uh, and that's exactly what she did today. So, someone else I'd point out, um, th- uh, there's another guy. Some of you know him, and some of you uh, maybe haven't met him. Uh, but he runs around the room um, every five, and in uh, most events, and even our camps, and he's taking photos. Uh, his name's Tyler Zaslov. Uh, there's Tyler, yeah. Um, if you've ever seen yourself in some photo on like our social media and you're like, hey, it's me, uh, it's because Tyler took the picture. And if you ever see something that's blurry and not very good, it's because I took the picture. Um, but Tyler um, is just gifted in this area. He's gifted in a lot of areas, but he just said, hey, how can I serve? How can I use this gift that God has given me to serve and bless this ministry? And he does, and it's a beautiful thing. And that's his path toward joy. Not just saying, I'll just do nothing and just hope God blesses me. It's to take his gift and put it into action. Um, let me just ask by show of hands, this is the only one I'll do on this, uh, but let me ask by show of hands, raise your hand if you are a leader uh, at FCA or any kind of Christian l- club on campus. Leader. Awesome. All over this room. Awesome. Thank you. Here's what these individuals are doing. They're saying, God has given me life. He's given me breath. He's given me the ability to lead. And I'm going to put it into action. I'm going to serve on my campus. I'm going to do something so that people can know Jesus, so that people can be encouraged. And they put their gifts into action. Not because it's always perfect or it's always easy. Every FCA leader in this room will tell you, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's overwhelming. Sometimes you don't know what to do. But you do it anyway. Because that's the point of this text. We can put that back on the screen, that that enter into the joy of my master. I believe there will come a day where everyone I just mentioned will see Jesus face to face and he will say to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. And they will hear these words, enter into the joy of your master. Because they did something, anything. Not everyone I mentioned, in fact, almost none of them are up here on the stage. It's not about being up on the stage. It's not even about being in the booth. It's about figuring out where your space is to serve. And rather than just talking about it, you go do something about it. You serve in a ministry. You love your family. You put something into action. You use what God has given you to bless the world. I want to go on to verse 24 here. It says in verse 24, it says, And he would receive one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what's yours. In other words, the first guy with five talents uses it to bless the world. The guy uses it to bless the world and he uses it to, to do something meaningful. He risks it, he does something with it. And the guy with two talents, he steps in and he does something with it. But then the guy with one talent, it says he buries it in the ground. He buries it. He does nothing with it. Again, this was my fear for some of you, that you would bury what God gave you in the ground and do nothing with it. 
I think some of you do this, and I think some of you do it for the same reason this guy did. He said, I was afraid, so I hid your talent in the ground. You can write this down, some of you, that unchecked fear will keep me from faithfulness. Like for you, some of the biggest reasons you won't be faithful with the gift God gave you is because you're afraid of something or someone. Like you're afraid. You're afraid if you get up here and use your gifts, whether it's on stage or behind the scenes or on your campus or in your family, you're afraid someone's going to resent you for how good you are. And so you're so afraid of that individual over there, that person, your mom or your sister, or your best friend resenting you, that you actually don't serve. And so what happens is you're so afraid of that person that God gets bumped off the throne and you put that guy on the throne. You put your sister on the throne. You put your mom on the throne of your life. You say, if she's going to resent me for this, I'm not going to do it. If he's going to be bitter at me, I'm not going to do this. Maybe some of you are afraid of failure. Like you actually want to try something. You want to try out for something. You want to step into a new space and do something. But you're so afraid if you fail, everyone will tell you, I told you so. And you're so afraid of their failure that you don't do anything. You're so afraid of their opinion of you that you sit around and do nothing with the gift that God's given you. Some of you are afraid of being misunderstood like you would totally use your life to bless people and minister and use your gift. You're just afraid people are going to think you're bragging. You're, you're afraid people are going to think that you're trying to promote yourself. Like I, th- I think some of you have a beautiful gift and ability um, to write words that stir people's hearts. And so you could actually post something on social media, on your Instagram, and put a bio that actually stirs people's hearts. And you read it and you just go, man, that blessed me tonight. But you're so afraid of a few people misunderstanding that. It's not everyone. It's a few people. You're so afraid of that that you don't do it. I think some of you could post videos uh, of you singing and leading worship. But you're so afraid of getting judged by a few people that you don't. You're so afraid of being perceived to be promoting yourself that you don't do it. And you bury your gift in the ground. Like, again, I don't know what your thing is, but I just think for some of you, you are so, you know exactly how God's gifted you. I talked at the beginning about some of you have no idea how God's gifted you, and you need to do some work on that. I think some of you know exactly how God's gifted you. You're just so afraid of someone else in this world that you're burying your gift in the ground. I want to give you the warning tonight, the danger of this blessing. Here's the warning. The warning is if you bury your gift in the ground, your life will be safe but not satisfying. I need you to know that. I need you to know that if you choose to take the gift, the passion, the skill, the ability that God has given you, and rather than use it for his glory unapologetically, if you choose to bury it in the ground and do nothing with it, here's the great news. No one will ever criticize you for it. If you bury your gift in the ground, you are safe. No one will ever criticize you. No one will ever misunderstand you. No one will ever judge you for it. Everyone will just look at you and be happy because you're not making them feel bad. It'll be a safe life. But at some point, you'll look up and you'll realize it's not a satisfying life. And that's my concern for you. Listen, I don't need anything from you. I'm not trying to stir you up to use your gifts because we need you to do a particular thing for high school ministry or this church or even this community. Listen, my, my, my greatest desire is that you would use your gifts so that you would know the satisfaction that comes from saying, listen, I'm getting criticized. People misunderstand me. It's not always perfect, but I am doing exactly what God put me on this earth to do. And I think some of you are living in such a way that that fear keeps you from doing it. And I'm telling you, it's a safe way to live. It's just not satisfying. Here's how the parable ends. Our band's going to come up and uh, we'll, we'll close in some worship. I want you to see how the parable ends, though. It's important. It says in verse 26, it says, But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seeds. Then you ought to have invested money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. But everyone who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worth of the servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so Jesus is telling this parable and it's kind of nice and it's kind of cute. And then it hits this part and you're like, whoa, Jesus. They started off with a guy giving out some money and now there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's that about? And here's what I think it's about. Jesus is not playing around here. Here's what I believe Jesus is teaching us here. Jesus is teaching us that the type of people who don't live their life to God's glory, who don't use their gifts, who don't use their abilities, those type of people, that is evidence that you never knew Jesus in the first place. So I want to be really clear here. When it talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's talking about not being saved. It's talking about hell. It's not talking about something else. But Jesus isn't saying, if you don't try hard enough, you go to hell. What he's saying is the type of people who are saved by Jesus and on their way to heaven are the type of the evidence that that's true is that you're living the kind of life 
where you're using your gifts and talents to bless the world. You're using your gifts and talents to honor people and to bless people and to serve the Lord and build up his church. That's the evidence. And so my concern for some of you tonight is that you would examine your hearts. And if you have literally nothing in your heart that says, I want to serve the Lord, if you say, you know what, my life is mine, I'm going to do what I want to do, I don't want to serve, I don't want to use my gifts, I don't want to do any of that, if that's your heart right now, I'm just going to go ahead and suggest to you that you examine your own heart to know whether you're actually saved. Because the type of people who actually know Jesus, God starts to change their heart in such a way that they say, I don't even belong to me, everything in my life belongs to the Lord, and so I'm going to use it to serve him and bless the world and honor people and lift up people and do everything I can. See, this is the story of the gospel. The story of the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ came into this world to live and die for us so that we could be brought into the family of God. And that when we're brought into the family of God, God gifts us as his children with spiritual gifts, with passion, with heart, with ability, with personality, with experience. He gifts us this way so we can put it into action. And then the gospel ultimately does two things for us. The gospel destroys my fear of failure. It keeps me from being afraid of failing. If I fail and you judge me for it, that's okay because God's already judged in my favor. If I fail and I mess up and I'm not good enough, God's already declared me good enough through the blood of Jesus. That's what the gospel does. It says even if people misunderstand you and judge you and snicker at you and laugh at you for using your gift, the most important judge of the universe has already declared you righteous in Jesus and you have nothing to fear, which is why the gospel destroys my fear of failure, but it also creates fuel for my faithfulness. Because when I start to go, you know, whatever happens, I'm just going to use the gifts God given me. My gift, he's just told me to go preach. I'm going to get up there and preach. What if some people don't like you? It's okay. I get to go be with God in heaven anyway. What if they judge you? They're not the real judge God is anyway. I'm going to use my gift. Even if you don't like it, even if you laugh at me, even if you snicker at me, you can't touch it because I'm not ultimately responsible to you. I'm not accountable to you. I'm accountable to God. And I hope everyone in this room has that same heart and attitude. You are ultimately responsible to the God of the universe. And what I or anyone else thinks is utterly irrelevant compared to what God says about you. And God says you are gifted. God says you are put here on purpose. You were made on purpose and for a purpose. And God wants you to use that gift to bless the world. And I hope each of you will take that seriously this week. Let's pray, and then we'll sing, believe in God's gonna fill us with faith to actually go do it. Father, thank you for your word. Thanks for the ways it challenges us, moves in our hearts. God, thank you um, for the gifting you've given to the people in this room. I pray for someone in this room who needs clarity, uh, that you would give them clarity this week on what their gifts are. And I pray for the young man or woman in this room who knows exactly what they need to do with your talents. I pray they'd have the courage and faith to put it into action. God, I pray we would experience that now as we sing. I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say.